title of this conversation, the subtitle of Conversation with a Mystic. That's only for you. I'm not conversing with a mystic, so I'm at ease. <laughs> That's my job. That's my job. Got it. <laughs> I know, and I have many questions, you know. <laughs> Sadhguru said, I've never seen someone with so many questions. He said, no answers, only questions. Um, I think the, the, the subtext, which I actually am talking about because I liked it, is an experiential, for today, an experiential symposium on optimal health and well-being. And I think there's a tremendous amount for us to talk about even in that phrase. One is the role of experience. And, and I will say that, um, you know, my office being responsible for cultural transformation, I've become obsessed with what is culture and the definition that I use because it guides our strategies is behavior, this definition was given to me by Admiral Grossenbacher, is behavior, either collective or individual behavior, based in experience and incentives. Meaning that if we're going to transform or shift what medical, the medical model is today and what healthcare is today, we can't start with just the data. If people do not have an inner experience, not much will change. Do you, can you say some about what you think the role of experience is in today and in healthcare? So you need to understand this. Largely for most human beings, experience is being kind of created and regulated by the way they think and feel. But what you think and what you feel need not necessarily have anything to do with reality as such. There is something called as a psychological reality and there is an existential reality. By controlling or handling the psychological reality well, a lot of people can become healthy, a lot. Because for a lot of them that is the cause of their ailment. And it can also fix other things to some extent. So, like right now uh, Mitch was talking about you know, somebody prays and somebody creates a certain attitude around them of love and care and compassion. This is all psychological structure. You create a psychological structure with which you become open to certain dimensions of life. You… it becomes a possibility to transact in a certain way with least amount of friction and creates well-being. But there's an existential dimension to this. Existentially, what are you made of? What are… what is the world made of, if you look at it? This is the most fundamental aspect of yoga. This is called as Bhut Shuddhi. This means elemental… cleansing of the elemental nature. The whole universe is a manifestation of five elements. So is this body. Out of these five, there are only four that you can really handle. Another one you just experience, it's the ambience for the other four. So the earth, water, fire, air and the space. So you only have to handle really four. With four ingredients, so much magic and mischief is happening in the universe. If there were four million, we would be <laughs> not able to handle it. Four for sure we can handle, isn't it? Four ingredients, if they're functioning the way you want them, then everything about you will be great. Out of these four, seventy-two percent of your water, I mean is… your body is actually water, so is the planet. The same composition of the planet you have in your body. About twelve percent is earth, about six percent is air, four percent is fire, the remaining is space. This is how it is looked at. If you master these four, even if you have a bit of control over these four, you will see miraculously you will generate health within the system. If you fail on this, then the next level of handling this is Nature has evolved certain things in the form of herbs and very things, many things which are helpful to us, so we can learn to use them. If you fail in that, then you can create a psychological structure which will create health for you. If you fail in that, then you go for the chemical treatment. If you fail in that, then you go for a surgery. So that's the escalation. <laughs> Direct intervention of cutting something, putting something. If nothing else, you are capable of doing. But now you are talking about a large-scale thing across the populations. We always think anything subtle cannot be done large-scale. I disagree with that, this is my opinion. 
because uh, it is just that we have not done enough work towards that and we assume that it's not possible. To create a certain sensitivity towards something and approach it in a subtle manner is possible, but it's only possible if it goes into every home, every parent, every man and woman in the… Uh, in the world or in the country, starts working towards it. When you want such a big goal to be achieved, it's not going to happen overnight. We must be willing to be committed for a whole generation or two, then something will happen. Something wonderful will happen. But right now we are in today's world, everything has to happen by today evening. If it doesn't happen, tomorrow we dump it and have a new project going. So in that context, it will not happen. In that context, it's bet better we work towards a plastic heart and a plastic liver and a plastic kidney where we can start replacing them every five years and somehow function. See, health does not mean that just the medical parameters are okay. Health means you must feel a certain sense of wholeness. The word health itself comes from that word whole. A certain sense of wholeness, when you wake up in the morning, you are more alive than you are when you went to bed. You feel ten years younger than the time when you went to bed. If you feel like that, that means you're healthy. It is just that all the tests are showing you're normal, that is still not normal because you have no experience of health. So when you say experience, ultimately we have come here only to experience life, isn't it? So we know that experience is the most important aspect of life. Now we're talking about the word experience in two different ways. One is our experience of life itself, how profound and how wonderful it is, or how nasty and how unpleasant it is. So the pleasantness that we generate in the body we call this as health. Right now, that is the object of discussion, I don't want to go further, but the same pleasantness, if it hits a higher pitch, we call it pleasure. But if your mind becomes pleasant, you would call it peacefulness. If it becomes very pleasant, you would call it joyfulness. If your emotions become pleasant, you would call it love or affection. If it becomes very pleasant, you would call it compassion. If your very life energy, if you make it pleasant, we call it bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. This is what a human being is seeking all the time. He wants pleasantness inside. Well, if your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. This is what every human being is looking for all the time. There is a whole science as to how to create the inner pleasantness. External pleasantness needs cooperation from many people. It's not just yours the other stakeholders who may want to make it nasty for you <laughs> It needs many people's cooperation, but inner pleasantness is one hundred percent yours. But why have we not strived for it? We have not strived for it because generally we have spread this message, it is not possible unless everything in the universe is fixed. When I first came to the United States, one word I was hearing everywhere is stress management. I could not understand this because in my mind, we manage things which are precious to us. Our family, our wealth, our business and whatever else which is valuable to us. Why would anybody want to manage stress? It's something I couldn't get for some time <laughs> It is just because we've spread the idea that stress is a part of your life. Stress is not a part of your life. Stress is not because of your job. Stress is simply because you do not know how to manage your own system. The um, uh, interesting now that I live in the Veterans Administration and I interface quite a bit with the Department of Defense, a statistic I was, I was in a meeting not very long ago and someone from the Department of Defense said, do you know this health in this country is an issue of national security? And I thought for a minute like, what is he talking <laughs> about, right? Because 80% of people that walk into a recruitment office for the armed services doesn't even qualify to be considered for service, 80% because of their health status. So the dominant medical paradigm is what you were describing, which is we have a disease that we have to fight. And our, you, it's revealed in the language that we use, you know, antibiotics, antipsychotics, anti, anti, anti. The concept that disease sits over there and the job of medicine is to fight that battle and win. So this… this whole uh, concept and this approach to modern medicine has come because you need to understand when they thought of medicine, when they thought of developing 
some kind of medicine and a system of medical treatment, their problem was only with infectious diseases and contagious diseases. How to treat the plague, how to treat the smallpox, how to treat this. Nobody ever thought of a diabetes or a hypertension or a cardiac problem. They never even considered those things that did not exist in their radar. In their radar, only infectious diseases did exist. That has to be handled on a war footing, no question about that, because it is a war. An infection means it's an invasion from another organism upon our own system and you have to use chemical weapons <laughs> You can't shoot them <laughs> So, this whole medical system evolved from the need to handle infectious diseases, contagious diseases which were taking a huge toll on populations in those times. But today we have come to a place where people are on self-help. That is, they manufacture their own diseases, they don't wait for <laughs> any infection to happen to them <laughs> because now they're on self-help. They need another system of medicine, another way to approach it completely, which is the shift we are struggling to make right now. I must tell you this experience. We had a yogic hospital in our yoga center in India. We called it yogic hospital. We did not want it to grow too much because we don't want to turn into a hospital full time. We are a spiritual center. <laughs> So we're keeping it low-key. Once when I came here, I spoke and a few doctors, American doctors who were interested, they traveled to India. They came and stayed there for three days and uh, after three days, uh, one of the volunteers came and told me all the American uh, doctors are up in arms, they want to leave. I said, what happened? Uh, they said, it's best that you meet them, they're just off. Then I said, okay, and I went to meet them. Then I said, what's the problem? They said, you said there is a hospital. Where is a hospital? There is no hospital here. I said, right now there are about sixty and odd patients. I said, where is it? Their idea of a hospital is that there must be beds, you must treat sick well and everybody should be… If you treat them so well, they will not want to become healthy <laughs> Where are the patients? I said, they're all in the garden, I put them to work. We give them the treatment and therapies and medication, but rest of the time I put them to work. Whatever they can do, they must do. Above all, they must sit and work barefoot and bare hands in with the soil. Just being in touch with the planet because you're just a drop of this planet, you're forgetting that. What you call as my body is just a piece of the planet, isn't it? If you lose connection with the source, will you not get disorganized? There are specific scientific ways of doing that. If you cannot do any of those things, at least just let them walk in a farm, barefoot, work, do something, you will see at least sixty, seventy percent of them will just come out of their problems just like that, just being in touch with this. I want to explore the way we educate physicians in this country. There's a lot of research around this in the United States <coughs> medical education that we take carrying compassionate people into our medical schools so it does not look as though the problem is our selection. People are come with open hearts and with compassion and love. And there is a lot of data that looks at what happens one year into medical training, two years into medical training. What the studies show is that one year, two years into training, empathy and compassion in the people that, that were empathetic, loving people when they came in has, has plummeted. And they self-report that their medical care, not surprisingly, is different. You know, this is not surprising. I guess the simple way to say this is, I believe if we cannot sit with our own suffering as physicians, we can't sit with the suffering of our patients. I'm comfortable dealing with your diabetes and hypertension because I have the tools to fix that, I believe, and I'm trained to do that. But I don't even want to open the door if I even knew what questions to ask that might reveal your suffering because I don't know how to be present with that. So I, I'd love your thoughts on that, those comments and then how do we begin to train and have our learners, our physicians to be and other healthcare providers put emotion at the same level as the intellect? So yeah, we are still uh, 
See, if you want flowers to grow in your garden, you don't have to think flowers, you don't have to chant flowers. You just have to think of soil, manure, water, sunlight. Nothing to do with flowers. If you handle filth well, flowers will happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. If you handle filth well, flowers will happen. Write that down. <laughs> Those people who think of flowers, they will end up with Chinese-made plastic flowers. Yes. They will not have flowers. So we're again thinking of empathy, compassion, love. These are all consequences of a human being being in a certain way. We are trying… see, the, the whole approach of the intellect is go for the fruit, goal-oriented. No, not the fruit, the root. You nurture the root, fruit will happen. Fruit is a consequence. You are shooting for the consequence without being interested in the cause. <laughs> That's not going to produce long-term results. Then this is what you will end up with, something that will work short-term and then that itself becomes a huge problem. Right now, healthcare system itself is a huge problem. The very fact that pharmaceutical industry is the second largest industry on the planet speaks volumes about our health, isn't it? People tell me, I do not know the statistic, these are all things which are, uh, you know, being circulated on the internet and things like that. They say almost thirty-seven percent of the medicine, all kinds of medicines manufactured in the world are consumed by Americans themselves. Uh, they don't even account for a minuscule of the population and if they're con consuming thirty-seven percent, either they're paranoid about their health or really they're unhealthy. One of these things must be true, isn't it? So, we need to look at this. If you want this to enter the medical school, one simple way is, if the medical school can start in some way, we can… we can prescribe a method with which First, one who wants to touch somebody else's body should make some effort to know about his own. Something very simple, need not be like you're not going to spend uh, twelve years in meditation. I'm… I'm sure that's not practical for you. But I'm saying at least twelve days. Twelve days, everybody can give, isn't it? Totally focused on the inward happenings of what's happening, I can do a simple experiment for you. Are you okay? If I treat you as a subject in an experiment? <laughs> See, just the hands, okay? Keep all the five fingers together, place it gently upon your thigh. With your eyes closed, you will inhale and exhale slightly deeper than normal. All of you, most of you are medical professionals, so you know much more about these things than me. But I want you to just notice how the air fills up into your lungs, or in other words, where is the maximum expansion and contraction. As you're doing this, I will say switch. When I say switch, without breaking the rhythm of your breathing, just turn these hands over. For those of you who cannot see, I'm raising this, you don't have to raise this upon your thigh. Just turn your hand over and continue to breathe. And once again, when I say switch, get back. In these two conditions of the hand, or the positions of the hand, Something about your breath will change. I want you to notice what it is. If you want to notice it, that what is needed is your spine should be erect, eyes should be closed and you must be focused on the breath. If you do these three things, you will distinctly notice this. All the five fingers should be together. Just breathe slightly deeper than normal. Inhalation, exhalation slightly deeper than normal, all five fingers together. Switch. Switch again. Please open your eyes. Do you notice some difference? What is it? If you hold it this way, the maximum expansion and contraction happens in, the, happens in the lower lobe of the lung. So you will notice it in the diaphragm region. If you turn it around, it moves to the middle lobe of the lung, you will notice it higher up. Just take one breath and see it is noticeable. Is it so? So something so simple, 
most human beings will not take these things into account. So just if you turn your hand around, the very way you breathe alters itself, it's not just a breath. The very way the fundamental life energies function in this body alters itself simply because you turned your hand around. How many times in a day unconsciously are you doing this and hoping to be peaceful? It doesn't work like that. This is like you got into your car, you don't know what these three pedals are, just kick any one of them whenever you feel like it. You know what a jerky driver you will be? <laughs> That's what has happened to human beings. It is not that people do not know peace, health, love, joy, they know all these things, but it's jerky, it's not sustainable, isn't it? If you did not know a moment of peace or joy, you would be on the suicide list. You know peace, you know love, only problem is you can't hold on to it, isn't it? That's because this is a chemical soup. If I give the same ingredients to all of you, soup ingredients to all of you, and each one of you make the soup, you will have still hundred varieties of soups, isn't it? The same ingredients, yes or no? Each home it tastes different just the way you make it. This also the same thing, same ingredients, just the way you make it within yourself, isn't it? <laughs> Whether it's health or well-being, peace, love, joy, ecstasy, every human experience has a chemical basis to it. And chemistry is not a basis, chemistry is also a consequence of a different dimension of who you are. I think uh, Mitch was putting up those five koshas and all. In yoga, because you're talking about the mind, in yoga we don't see anything as mind. All different levels of bodies, physical body, mental body, energy body, etheric body and the other one will not translate well, it's called bliss body in English but that's a wrong translation <laughs> So, physical body is something that you gather because of the food that you've eaten. So what kind of food you've eaten definitely interpret itself as the nature of the body that you have. Well, your genetics, the other information has a serious impact but still the design of this building is important, but still the material is also important, isn't it? Even if the design is fabulous, if the material is bad, still the whole building may not fall down on our heads, but panels could be falling on our heads. So this is happening, we are… we are not considering what we eat as to what is the best thing for this body. So food, the next thing is mental body. There is a whole intelligence, there's a network of intelligence across this. When we say mind, what are we referring to? A certain level of memory and a certain level of ability to use that memory in the form of intelligence, isn't it? You tell me if you… being… all of you being doctors, you know this very well. A single cell, what it is doing, it can freak your mind. <laughs> it is doing that many things, isn't it? There's no question about that. And your single cell, what it remembers, it can freak your mind once again. See, do you remember ten generations ago how your grandmother looked? No. no. You have no memory of that. Your body remembers, your grandmother's nose is still sitting on your face because your body remembers. How your forefathers looked a million years ago, it still remembers, isn't it? Now, uh, if I have to speak, I am sitting like this because I have no sitting as thought in my mind. It's very difficult for you to understand is that's why they uh, diagnosed me as dead. <laughs> because I think with my body, I function with my body, not just with one part. So whole process of life is right now being subjected to thought and people are stressful because what should happen on different levels of your system is all being done in one place. If it's all done in one place, just living. Most people are only taking care of their survival, earning a living, reproducing and dying one day. For that they freaked out. They're not uh, <laughs> handling some galaxies, just their lives. <laughs>